listen to podcasts or listen to the radio while they're doing something else. And the goal, for me anyway, as a reporter in audio, is to stop them doing the something else, make them concentrate on the story that I'm telling them. So you need to surprise them, sometimes mystify them. What was that? You know, they're half listening to something, and then suddenly there's a noise which they don't recognise. And they go, whoa, what did I just miss? As I spent most of my career at the BBC and in radio, I thought I would talk to you a little bit about radio and audio, and in particular, uh, what has always fascinated me, which is about the use of sound in radio. It sounds obvious, but radio journalism in particular comes alive when you use sound imaginatively. And I don't just mean the human voice, which is the obvious means of communication in any audio medium. It's the prime means of communication. Um, I mean sound as in natural sound, because there's a saying among us radio folk, you may be familiar with it, that the pictures are always much better on radio because it's the listener who makes the pictures. And the paint with which a listener makes the pictures is sound. So if you provide them with sound, you enable them to make the picture of where you are. Whenever I report for radio, for any kind of audio medium, the thing I have in my head is that I am taking the listener on a journey. I am, metaphorically, taking the listener by the hand and saying, come with me, there's something I want to show you. There's a story I want to tell you. Because any piece of journalism is, is, is the telling of a story. It has a narrative. And if you're doing it for an audio medium, whether it's a podcast or for a, whether it's a radio news program, whatever it is, you are using sound as the way of escorting the listener on that journey. So obviously you have a script, you have the narrator, you have the people to whom the reporter is talking along the way, but you also have the sound of the places where you are going. If you think about any kind of storytelling, if it's storytelling in a book for children, it has words and pictures. If it's a, a piece of drama on a stage, it has scenery. If it's a film, obviously it has the mise-en-scene, it has the whole cinematography. It needs more than just a simple once upon a time. It needs something to help the, the viewer, or the listener in this case, create a picture in their own mind. Whenever I was out reporting for radio, uh, we would first of all, normally I would work with a producer, uh, ask ourselves what's the story we want to tell. Then we would ask ourselves who do we want to talk to to help us tell this story. That much is obvious. Any journalist does that in any medium. But the next question which we asked, which I think is peculiar to broadcast journalism, whether radio or, or television, is where do we want to talk to this person? What do we want to have going on as we talk to this person? And in, in radio or audio, it's important because if you have some interesting sound going on while you're talking to somebody, it helps the listener to place what this person is saying in context and to draw the picture. So what I wanted to do was play you a few clips from stuff that I've done over the years, all of which illustrate this use of sound in a different way. And not by coincidence, most of the bits that I've chosen to play to you are from the beginnings of radio reports that I've done. And the reason for that is actually quite simple. If you don't grab a listener's attention right at the beginning, you've failed. Because they're either going to turn off, or they're going to switch channels, or if they're listening to a podcast, they're just going to look for another podcast if you haven't grabbed them. It's like a headline in a newspaper, or the first sentence in a newspaper or magazine article. So the first sound that the listener hears at the beginning of a piece of radio journalism is really crucial. And you've only got five, maybe 10 seconds in which to grab them. 
Because otherwise one of two things will happen. Either they will literally turn off, or they will mentally turn off. Most people listen to podcasts or listen to the radio while they're doing something else. And the goal, for me anyway, as a reporter in audio, is to stop them doing the something else <coughs> and to make them concentrate on the story that I'm telling them. So you need to surprise them. You need to sometimes mystify them. What was that? You know, they're half listening to something. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Somebody's talking in the background, and then suddenly there's a noise which they don't recognize. And they go, whoa, what did I just miss? Now, if that comes at the beginning of the report, that's great. But uh, it doesn't only have to be at the beginning of the report. You need, let's say, in a 10-minute report, you need two or three other moments. Otherwise, the listener's drifted off again and gone to make a cup of coffee or whatever. So most of these clips, as I say, are from the beginnings of reports. And I'm going to go through them. I've got about five or six. Go through them one by one, talk about them a little bit, and then we can chat either about that or about something completely different. Um, first one I want to play you is from a trip I did to Bhutan some years ago. Bhutan is a tiny kingdom high in the Himalayas. It is sandwiched between Tibet and India. It is the world's only Buddhist kingdom. It is very remote. Very few people know anything about it. What was interesting about Bhutan, and which is still interesting about Bhutan, is the, the official government policy, both when it was an absolute monarchy and now that it's a sort of constitutional monarchy, is that the overriding aim of government is to maximize what they call gross national happiness. Not gross national product, but gross national happiness. So I was sent off to Bhutan to make a half hour radio report about how do you maximize gross national happiness? Now, I have a horror of economic policy. I don't understand economic policy. I'm not terribly interested in economic policy. This is a form of economic policy. It is extraordinarily difficult to describe on radio. How would you start a report which, which is about gross national happiness? What would be the first sound that you would look for, do you think, to try and grab a listener's attention. Any thoughts? Laughter. David? I, I, I think I would go for the sound of uh, someone's wailing, utter distress and unhappiness, but maybe that's because I'm a kind of rather bleak and half-glass empty person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I work for the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be surprised. <laughs> Have a listen to this and then see if you think it works. Bhutanese men being happy. It's Saturday morning and they're indulging in Bhutan's national sport, Datsa or archery. Two teams, each wearing traditional dress of brightly coloured calf length robes, firing arrows and mocking their rivals when they miss. They take happiness seriously here in Bhutan, so seriously that maximising gross national happiness is official government policy. It was the king's idea originally. He said it's more important to care about the environment, social equality, cultural traditions and good governance than simply to concentrate on economic growth. Being richer, he said, is not the same as being happier. But for men like Put Tsering, being happy is having a bow and arrow in your hands. You get the idea. Archery is a national sport. Men doing archery at the weekend laugh a lot. That's the way into gross national happiness. <coughs> what? I hoped you would get from that was the way in which the sound and the script work together. Because what you need to do when you have a piece of sound like that is explain, first of all, what it is that the listener is hearing, but then why they're hearing it, what its relevance is to the story that you're going to tell them. So you say, here are men having a good time with their bows and arrows. It's to do with gross national happiness, which is government policy. And you kind of put the two things together. So a combination of the sound of the script, you hope, will intrigue the listeners sufficiently for them to keep listening. And the challenge we had on that particular piece was that because people know nothing about Bhutan, not where it is, not who lives there, not why it's of any interest, you really have to start from square one. And so that seems to us to be a a relatively painless way into quite a long and quite complicated piece of radio.
as I say, 30, 28 minutes, something like that, about an economic policy. Okay, that's clip one. Um, the second one is from South Sudan, which, as you may know, is the world's newest country. It is also in the most appalling state. It degenerated into civil war almost as soon as it gained its independence. There is famine. There is what some officials already call genocide, mass murder by different ethnic groups. Absolutely horrendous situation. I was there uh, almost exactly two years ago when things were beginning to get really, really bad. So imagine to yourself that you have a studio presenter saying, right, we're now going to hear a report from South Sudan. It's the world's newest nation. It's in a terrible state. Robin Lustig has been there. Here's his report. Put a picture in your head. It's going to be absolutely ghastly. And here is what you hear. <laughs> Children singing to keep their spirits up behind the razor wire. They may sound happy enough for now, but they're facing hunger and disease in a squalid makeshift camp in a United Nations military compound. These children are among more than a thousand people here in the compound. They fled from their homes after armed gangs attacked their villages. In their open-air schoolroom, with the blazing sun beating down on them, their teacher tells me she is trying to provide an education. The point about that is that the sound of children singing a happy song is exactly the opposite of what you would expect to hear. And again, it struck me as a useful way of trying to engage a listener's attention. Because they've heard the introduction to the report, it's all going to be grim, it's ghastly, it's children dying of malnutrition, and suddenly you hear these happy little family kids. And the way I got that audio was simply by saying to the teacher, I saw all these children sitting out in the dust, and I just said to her, do they ever sing songs? And she said, oh yes, we'd love to sing you a song. You know, children sing a song. And that was the song they sang. And it was just such a lovely sound and such an unexpected sound. And then when you put it together with my script, which then says, you know, this is really awful, these kids are in fear of their lives. And you get that kind of dissonance between the sound of the song and what the script is saying. Again, I hope you've intrigued a listener. You've got a listener going, what on earth is going on here? These kids sound like they're having a whale of a time. There is a cliche, which I'm sure you've seen on television, which you've heard on radio. When a reporter starts a report from a refugee camp, from a scene of hunger, malnutrition, whatever, the first sound you hear very often is of a baby crying. It is the most obvious sound. So I liked the idea of doing the opposite because, I don't know about you, but a lot of people, when they hear that cliche, they zone out. Heard that a hundred times before. I know I should be listening, but really, I don't want to. This was different. Clip number three comes from Peru. Um, I was in Peru to do a story about how it had overtaken Colombia as the world's biggest producer of cocaine, or rather of coca, which was used to produce cocaine. And uh, my colleague and I went to the <coughs> coca growing region of Peru and the foothills of the Andes uh, to do the story. Not particularly easy to do because, of course, it's illegal to grow coca. People aren't terribly happy to show you that they're growing coca. But we did find ourselves in a place where we could get the story done. And here's how it started. Called the High Amazon. It's where the Andes meet the Amazon jungle. It's a thriving bustling town, you can probably hear all the traffic noise, and coca has been an intrinsic part of life here for a very long time. In fact, right where I'm standing, here in the centre of town, there are two huge sacks of coca leaves being sold perfectly openly. Hola, buenos dias, good morning. Por supuesto, una pequeña bolsa. Un sola, un bolsito, un sola. Okay, I'll have, I'll have a small bag. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, so what should I do with it? Mastica, mastica, para te, pa tomar te. So I can chew it, I can make tea with it. How would it make me feel? Uh, 
It's good for my health, she says. It'll make me feel great, make me feel strong. And to buy coca leaf like this, unrefined, unprocessed, it's perfectly legal. It's being sold perfectly openly. It's when it's processed, refined, when it's turned into cocaine, very different matter. That's where the problems start. I was hoping there would be an element of surprise. All of a sudden, you hear Robin buying coca leaves to make tea with or to chew in Peru. It's unusual. It's uh, People who listen to The World Tonight were used to hearing me in a studio doing interviews with politicians. The idea that I was out there in the streets of Peru buying cocaine, or coca, not cocaine, uh, I hope would surprise them. And that the noise of the street behind was loud, it was bustly. Did it help you to paint a picture in your head? Just hearing that and hearing me describe where I was in front of these two huge bags. The idea is just to sort of take the listener to where I was and, and help them imagine that they were there with me. The next one is very different. It was another one of these assignments which makes your heart absolutely sink. I was in America to do a series of reports leading up to the 2012 presidential election. And we were very keen to do stuff that was different from what everybody else was doing. So rather than looking at the candidates, who's doing well, who's doing badly, we were looking at some of the issues underlying the election campaign. And the editor of the program had this really bright idea which made my heart sink, which was to do a piece about how America was lagging behind in innovation. America got big and rich and strong by being very good at innovation, technological innovation. But there was a fear, he thought, in America that they were beginning to lag behind. And that once you'd got <coughs> Google and Amazon and all the other great technological innovations, Apple, Microsoft, all of which came from America, um, that America was beginning to run out of steam. So would we please do a radio report about that? How do you illustrate in sound the lack of innovation? Uh, it was a tough one. So I did what any good reporter does. I sat down with my laptop, I started Googling. And I Googled US innovation to see what would come up. And I discovered that in Atlanta, Georgia, there is an institute of innovation where they research these things. <coughs> so we phoned them up and we told them what we were up to and we said, do you have anything going on there that might help us as radio reporters? And they said, well, we have a music department. We said, that sounds promising. So they said, OK, come down to Atlanta, and we'll uh, fix you up with our music department. And here is the beginning of what you heard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the Georgia Institute of Technology, on the piano, Gil Weinberg, and on the marimba, Shimon, who doesn't have a second name because he is a robot. A robot that can watch and listen and improvise to match the mood and the style of his musical partner. Not quite Thelonious Monk, perhaps, but Gil Weinberg, who built him, says Shimon is an important evolutionary step to a whole new world of robotics. So, we breathed a sigh of relief. We had a sound. There were two things about it that, that struck me. First of all, I thought the robot was dreadful <laughs> at improvising jazz. I thought it just sounded bad. <laughs> However, it was a robot improvising jazz. You will notice that the script began in a rather unusual way for a piece of journalism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. And I, I did that again because I hoped it would take listeners by surprise. It didn't sound like a Radio 4 news program, which is what it was. And it was, you know, a picture I could try and help them form in their minds of a late night jazz cafe or a club with a bit of funky music going on and a robot playing the marimba. It was a way into a report about innovation, because this robot, so we were told, was at the cutting edge of that kind of what we would now call artificial intelligence or whatever. 
sure it entirely worked, but it was an attempt to do it. Right, I've just got two more. Um, one of the problems with relying on audio is that you don't have access to graphics or to, picture, uh, to uh, maps in particular. So if you're in a place which is unfamiliar to people, you have to find some way of explaining to them where you are, so that, again, so they can picture it in their mind. Just before the 2014 Winter Olympics, which were held in Sochi in Russia, I was sent to Sochi to do a documentary about the preparations for the Winter Olympics and the controversy surrounding them. How many of you are confident that you'd be able to find Sochi on a map? It's tricky. So I thought at some point in this report, and this actually isn't from the beginning of the report, I would have to help the listener with a sort of audio map. And this is how I did it. Well, if you're having some difficulty finding Sochi on a map, perhaps I can help you with a bit of geography, because I'm up here on the roof of my hotel, looking right out over the Black Sea. Just a mile or so down to the south, I can see the huge domes of the new Winter Olympic structures. That's one of the Olympic clusters right down on the seafront. A couple of miles further south, the border with Georgia. Looking up to my right, north, a few hundred miles up there, is the border with Ukraine. If I turn round, though, and look behind me, I see the mountains of the Caucasus, the peaks covered in snow, and about 30 miles up into the mountains, that's where the mountain Olympic cluster is, that's where the skiing and the bobsleighing and all of those events will be. You've got the mountains up there, you've got the sea down here. So, it's again, it's a way of painting a picture with words. I couldn't do it with sound in that particular case, because there's no sound of geography, but I could go onto the roof of top of the hotel and literally just describe what I could see, that direction, that direction, turn around and look behind me at the Caucasus Mountains. Again, a way of helping the listener come on the journey that I was on. It's a bit clunky, it's a bit literal, but I think sometimes it has to be done because if the listener doesn't really know where you are physically, it's very hard for them to follow you on your journey. The last clip I want to play you uh, is from Mexico, I was there to do a story about migration through Mexico, illegal migration. Uh, the story was not so much about Mexicans crossing into the United States, but of other migrants from further south, from Central America, particularly from Guatemala, from El Salvador, who were transiting through Mexico in order to get to the United States, doing so illegally, and a lot of them doing it by jumping on trains. Um, one train in particular, a huge freight train known as La Bestia, the Beast, which young guys would jump onto and try and get through Mexico on board. Obviously it would have been wonderful if we could have found the train itself and record it. As luck would have it, we found ourselves close to the railway line within an hour or so of the train due to come through. So we decided to wait. And as the time for the train approached, about a dozen or so young guys turned up at the track side and it was quite clear that they were going to jump on board. It was our lucky day and we got this. And here it is, the train they call La Bestia, the Beast, heading north to the border of the United States. Half a dozen or so young men waiting to get on board, some of the ones we've just been speaking to. If the train is not going terribly slowly, there goes one of them, he's jumped up and he's on. And the rest of them looking for an opportunity to get up on board the train. And there's another one, he's jumped, he's on. And a third, on their way north, heading to what they hope will be a better future. A piece of real drama. We had no real expectation that we would find that. We were just very lucky. We were in the right place at the right time. Turned on the microphone, got the locomotive sounding the horn, which to me is one of the most evocative sounds ever. You hear that sound of an American locomotive and you know exactly what that sound is. Then the guys jumping on board and you can hear the shouts as they do so. And it is just real drama. And I hope you felt, as I hope all listeners would feel, that they were there. They could see this happening. There were these guys jumping on board a train. So there you've got um, 
a few clips from very different places and very different kinds of stories, but all using sound as a way of helping to report a story. Um, it's very easy to tell a story in a boring way in audio. You just go and interview somebody and you edit the interview and you shove it out. The human voice can be wonderful, of course it can, particularly if you get a good interviewee who talks very, uh, with great expression and is interesting to talk to. But you do need more. I used to work with one producer who always said to me, as well as deciding who we're going to talk to, what we're going to ask them, and where we're going to place them for this interview, we need to make one other decision as well. What are we going to hear before we talk to them? What is the way into that interview? As I, as the reporter, am saying, um, so, uh, what's going to happen at the University of Sussex? I asked uh, Professor Ivor Gaber, what do we hear as I'm saying those words? It's really boring if we're hearing nothing at all. So, I could place myself in the cafe. I could place myself in a lecture theatre with a lecture going on behind me. I could place myself at Brighton Railway Station. I could place myself in all kinds of different places, but have something else going on to help the listener imagine where I am to keep them interested. I'm going to start off just with one question then. Let's just say, I mean, that, that, make, that Mexican piece was really very, very powerful. Um, let's just say you came back to either to your hotel room studio and you discovered that um, although you've got the the sound of the um, the the, the, the clarion or whatever what do, we, what do they call it the horn the horn and you've got the boys jumping on the actual audio of the clump 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 was distorted you were too close but you've got the real guts of it the horn and the thing. Would you be happy to go into a studio and lay some effects of American trains going bump, 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 given it's not the central part of the story? I wouldn't be happy. I would be tempted to ask somebody, when's the next train? That's and in next week. Ah. <laughs> it's tricky. The official answer that the BBC would give you was, no, you can't do that. That's misleading the listener. I, I, I've got a story, actually, about trains. Um, I was in Belarus a couple of years ago, doing another story, actually, about migration. And we were recording a sequence on the railway station where a migrant in the early 20th century had set off from his little village in Belarus on his way to America. And uh, as we were talking to our interviewee on this railway station, we said, oh, by the way, when, when is the next train due through here? It's a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. It could well have been next week. And they said, oh, there's actually there's a train due in about an hour. We said, oh, actually, can, can we stay? We'd quite like to record the sound of the train coming in. Yeah, OK, if you want to, fine. And after we'd waited maybe 20 or 30 minutes, our translator said, um, can I ask you something? OK. Do trains in Belarus sound different <laughs> to trains anywhere else? She couldn't understand why we were going to sit there twiddling our thumbs for an hour just to get the sound of a train rumbling across a track in Belarus, well, we could have done it anywhere. It's to do with authenticity. Somebody somewhere will know if you have faked it. Particularly with trains. There are Particularly trains. trains. There are enough people in the world who know what trains sound like. But that wasn't Belarus. That was Britain. Um, so, no, I, I'd be really unhappy to use an effects disc. The reason I ask it is because you've got these really strong sounds, mm. and it'd be a pity not to use them just because we haven't got a few more. Anyway. <coughs> Look, I mean, I, I have got a hundred stories I could tell you of doing the most absurd things in order to get legitimate, authentic sound. Um, I remember in Chicago once, uh, walking through a park, and my producer suddenly said, stay here for a minute. And she started running after a duck that had come up onto the grass from the lake. And it took me a few moments to realize what she was doing. She wanted to record the duck quacking. And she was running around like a lunatic, holding her microphone out, trying to get this duck to quack, which of course it refused to do. Um, we could easily have got an effects disc of a duck quacking, but it wouldn't have been. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, authenticity is important, because if a listener knows you have faked something, even if it's the sound of a train, 
How can they be sure that you haven't faked everything else? Once you've lost their trust on a, one small thing, you've lost their trust altogether. Which is why when I started as a journalist a very, very long time ago, I was told that the worst mistake you could make was misspelling somebody's name. Because if you get their name wrong and they see it, they don't know what else you've got wrong. Do not ever misspell somebody's name. And if I may give you a piece of advice, the best way to ensure that you've spelled somebody's name right is to give them your notebook and say, would you please write down your name? And that way. And to get them to introduce themselves on the tape so you know how they pronounce it. Absolutely. Uh, can I be really greedy? I've got a couple of questions that I wanted to ask, really. One is about, um, about the sort of perennial risk of kind of cliché, and um, I'm absolutely, it's clear that you avoided that risk entirely, but I mean, a, a producer that I work with regularly has this sort of theory, a sort of entropy theory, which is that <clears throat> every time a particular sound gets used, its power is depleted just a little tiny bit. And that therefore something that is is not currently a cliche is always potentially at risk of becoming one. And I just sort of wonder how you sort of how you navigate that. I mean, how how difficult is it to constantly search for the the, the sound which is not the first thing that comes to mind? It's very difficult because the reason something becomes a cliche is that it works. Um, as, as you may remember, there is a, an unspoken rule in BBC Radio, which is that if you're doing any kind of reporting from the Arab world, you do not begin at the report with the sound of a muezzin calling the faithful to prayer, because it has been done a thousand times before, and it's a cliché. But it's a problem, because it's the most evocative sound you can find in a Muslim country, is the sound of a muezzin calling the faithful to prayer. Um, the locomotive horn is a cliché, but because it was in the middle of a piece and was then followed by something else, I think it was forgivable. I think there are times when you can't avoid a cliché, but I think you always have to try, um, which was one of the reasons behind the ladies and gentlemen, please welcome line of script from Atlanta, Georgia, which is, it was just a different way into a piece of script. The cliché way into a piece of script was the format I used in the South Sudan piece, which is a, a half sentence describing what the sound is, children singing in a United Nations compound. It's like a caption to a photograph. Um, it's a very effective, efficient way of conveying information beneath sound. Um, one line of script that I still remember very vividly, because I was very proud of it at the time, was when I happened to be um, in Cambodia at the beginning of a civil war when two bits of the army decided to start fighting each other. And <clears throat> to our discomfort, they decided to do so outside the hotel where we were staying. So we just hung a microphone out of the window and recorded <coughs> the sound of this unbelievable battle going on in the street. And so we had lots of gunfire and artillery shells and all the rest of it. And the line of script I had was an army fighting itself. And it just seemed to me that that was the most efficient way of telling people what was going on. I think avoiding cliché is one of the most important things you have to do in a script. My second question was about movement, the importance of movement, because, like you say, some, some situations you find yourself in, with a bit of research and, and, and setting up, you're able to create a, a sound event or sometimes the sound event is just there. It's a busy street, it's, it's vibrant, it's noisy, and, and so on. Some places, with the best will in the world, remain sort of sonically inert. Uh, and, and I wondered then what, what the element of movement, uh, how useful movement is. In other words, moving through a space, or at least, uh, again, planning, constructing, in a sense, a certain way of moving. Uh, in order to create a sort of shifting acoustic or uh, some sense of drama? I mean, is that... Is that oh, uh, you put your finger on a, a, a real issue. Um, again, two anecdotes. Um, the worst place I have ever reported from in terms of audio uh, is Phoenix, Arizona. 
which like a lot of towns in not on the coasts of the United States, has no real heart to it. It has no real downtown. All it has is very wide roads, very smooth, along which cars glide at 40, 45 miles an hour, making no sound at all. There's no sign of shops because the shops are all miles out of town in malls. And there was no sound of any kind. And we were in real despair because this whole report was centered on Phoenix, Arizona, and we had to have sound. So we started asking everybody we talked to, can you think of anywhere where there's sound? And one of our interviewees said, well, I'm going to be playing tennis tomorrow morning. There's the tennis club. We said, yes, tennis club. So off we went, and we recorded tennis club. And then we did the interview with him at the tennis club. It was not great, but it was better than nothing. Um, the other thing you can do, but it is a cliche, is you record yourself walking along a street. And you just hear a little bit of the footsteps as you're walking along. You say, well, I'm walking down Main Street, and on my right is this, and on my left is that. I'm on my, on my way to see so-and-so. And, -so. and you, you do a bit of movement like that. One producer I worked with had a genius idea. We were driving, again, in America. And we were constructing the piece in our heads as we were driving. And we were at a loss as to how to move the script from place A to place B just didn't have a join. And uh, as we were driving along, suddenly the uh, GPS said, you know, turn right to the next intersection. We said, yes, we record that. We recorded the GPS. And it took us as a, a literally a junction between two sections of our report. And it was a cliche. It wasn't terribly exciting. But it was a piece of sound, and it might have fulfilled that function of getting a listener go, what? Did I just hear a GPS? Which you don't expect to hear on a sort of Radio 4 News report. So there are all kinds of ways of doing it. I had one producer who drove me mad one day when he wanted to record me walking along some gravel. And so he had me walking, and he had the microphone down my, by my feet. He said, no, this gravel isn't right. You've got to find some different gravel. And we went off finding different kinds of gravel until he was happy with the sound that it was making. All of these things, I mean, the journey is absolutely critical, I think. The, list, the listener has to start in place A and end in place B. And, and you, you can't lose the, the listener along the way. And so if you record yourself walking along, or sometimes you just have to say in script, well, I've come now to the University of Sussex. And the reason I'm here is that I want to talk to David Hendy. And off you go. Do you not think that technique we used to stand up of the reporter putting themselves in the picture is overused. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great if you could get away without doing it, but sometimes it just isn't, mm. isn't an alternative. But the other thing is... Is it currently being overused in your view? I suppose that's what I'm saying. Well, you know the, the cliche. What is it? RI, reporter involvement? Although, contradicting myself, one of the strengths of, uh, forgive the cliche, it's serial, is it's all about, I'm now about to walk into the house and talk to the guy. Actually, that's what it, one of its strengths. Yeah, yeah but I mean, the, it, its strength is that even though there's a lot of, I'm now about to, the script is varied and inventive enough to say that in a, in a myriad different ways. And that, it, so I think it's kind of, for me, it's not, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. <laughs> To deploy a cliche. There is also, I, I mean, one of the things I think which, which is the strength of podcasts or <coughs> audio reporting is that you can give the listener the impression that you're just talking to them, that this is just a communication between two people, the reporter and the listener, and you're saying to them, hey, come here, look, come with me. We're going to go and talk to person X or, or, or person B. Um, when Terry Wogan died a few weeks ago, Somebody referred to the fact that in his very last broadcast on his show, on Radio 2, he said, thank you for being my friend. Singular, not plural. And it's a really interesting difference, because he was saying to each one of his, however many million listeners it was, you're my friend. And because the program that I used to present was a late night program, people often listened in bed. and when, at the end of the program, I said, good night, a lot of people used to say to me, 
I felt you were saying it to me. And I think that's, again, the impression you try to inculcate as any kind of audio reporter. It's the most intimate of mediums. It's just a reporter's voice and a listener's ears. And the listener would like to think that it's just the two of you. And so I think that the, the serial um, technique of, I'm now going to try and find out X, mm. or I, I think we now really need to go in on this and work out what. It's, it's a conspiracy between the two. Yeah, yeah. Works. Um, I was just wondering about the element of risk. When you decide that you're not going to use a cliche, there is a risk in whatever you decide to use. So I was quite interested in the Sudan one where you use the singing children and then you're talking about the horrors of their life. Mm. And I kind of wondered whether you thought that that worked because there was an element of risk in deciding to go with yours and your producer's idea when that's not the expectation of your audience. There is an element of risk, definitely. Um, there is also an element of desperation. <laughs> <laughs> which is that, you know, we knew we didn't want the baby crying. Yeah. What else was there? Um, I will confess to a weakness for children singing. If you ever had the misfortune to sit down and listen to an awful lot of my reporting over the years, you would hear an awful lot of children singing. Uh, it happens to be a sound I like. It happens to be a sound that I think quite a lot of people like. Uh, and it's not difficult to get. Because wherever you have a group of children in a school or a playground or wherever, you say, sing me a song, they'll sing you a song. Um, if there were alternatives, yeah, I would very happily go for the alternative. But one of the tests, I think, that you set yourself if you say, I'm not going to do the cliche, is then to find the alternative. Um, children singing in a re refugee camp? I don't know. I, I don't think I've heard it very often. But yeah, it, yes, it's a risk. I just wondered um, to what extent, I mean, obviously, as you became better known within the, uh, you know, the BBC and at large, when you went to a place, did you ever think that your presence maybe influenced the behaviour of the people around you? And people maybe did things because you were there. I just wondered how you would counteract against that, because presumably that was a risk. The words BBC are a, like, like a bulb to a moth. Yeah, people will flock if they hear that there's a BBC microphone in town. Um, it does worry me quite a lot. Um, I'll give you one example. After Princess Diana died in that Paris road accident, um, huge crowds of people gathered outside Kensington Palace to lay flowers and all the rest of it. And I went down there to do some box pops, to do some interviews with people. And I collected the most extraordinary range of people being extremely hostile to the royal family, saying really ugly things about the Queen and Prince Charles. And I was a bit nervous about it. I thought, I, I don't know what I'm getting here. Maybe it's just the most vocal, the most angry are the people who are talking to me because I've got a microphone. Um, so I went back to the office and I said, I don't think we should run this. I'm not happy that it's, it's representative. So we didn't. And over the next couple of days, it became the story, was this apparent groundswell of hostility towards the royal family. And I'd made a mistake. I mean, my judgment had been wrong. I'd actually got hold of some material that was genuinely interesting, but I didn't trust it. Because I was thinking exactly what you're thinking, which is that the people who talk to a microphone are not necessarily the people who have the most interesting things to say or who are most representative. Um, you're familiar with the term Vox Pops, just going out into the street and interviewing people at random. I hate them. Um, I don't like doing them. I don't think they are terribly useful, but producers and editors love them. So I have had to do an awful lot of Vox Pops. They can have their uses, and sometimes they do produce a real little nugget, but they're very difficult to evaluate, they're very difficult to edit, and if there's a way of not doing them, I, I would rather not doing them. Um, sometimes it works in your favor if you're able to say, I'm from the BBC and you're going to be on air, because it encourages people to talk to you who otherwise might not. Um, I was once in Baghdad shortly after the invasion in 2003, 
and we were interviewing a group of unemployed men on a street who were waiting for casual employment. And as I was talking to them, more and more people gathered, uh, all wanting to tell their story, until I was completely surrounded. And um, because of the security situation, I, uh, the BBC had insisted that I and my colleague had a security guy with us. And suddenly he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, we're out of here, come on, move. <coughs> Dragged me out of the crowd, put me in the car and we drove off. I said, what, what was that about? What was the problem? He said, there were so many people around you. If I'd waited any longer, I would not have been able to get you out. And at that point, you're at real risk if you're stuck somewhere. So it is a problem. I've always tried, if I can, to interview people out of the main street out of the way a little bit, because people do congregate around a microphone, sometimes to good effect, sometimes to bad effect. Um, I once in Egypt recorded the most extraordinary argument between two random Egyptians on the street who had just started arguing with each other because they saw me. I was doing a stand up actually, just trying to do a little piece standing on the pavement. But they came up, and so happened it was just after the revolution. One was pro-Mubarak, one was anti-Mubarak. <coughs> they started going at each other. It was a fantastic piece of radio. And it, happened spontaneously. So, pluses and minuses. How do you make the, um, the relationship between the um, queue and the reporter's intro interesting? Okay, the queue is the introduction that is read by the presenter in the studio before going into the tape report. Uh, and it's usually 150, 200 words long. And it just sets up whatever the story is and where the reporter is reporting from. Um, I think the rule should be Absolutely. The, the reporter, before he or she writes the script, writes the cue, writes the intro, so that there is a natural progression. The story begins with the introduction, read by the host or the presenter of the program, and then it moves in. Presenters, I am a presenter, like rewriting them very often. But at least if they've got something to work with, they know what the information is that needs to be conveyed in order to make sense of what's going to be heard. If, for example, from South Sudan, my first words of script have been, here in South Sudan, da 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 da, you don't want the introduction to finish with the words, Robin Lustig reports from South Sudan. Because that's just repeating things unnecessarily, and it sounds unprofessional, and it sounds boring. So one person says it, or the other person says it, but not both. It's an integral part of the report, in my view, is the introduction. In my experience, very few reporters do that, and I think they should all be spanked hard until they do it. So there. A few presenters have been known to rewrite introductions without listening to the package. No. <laughs> we used to work together. <laughs> what kind of advice could you give someone who's looking to get into radio journalism? <laughs> what a good question. <laughs> do it. Just start doing it. Um, Thank God for podcasts. You can make audio reports, you can put them online, you can send them as a WAV file to whoever you're trying to get a job with and say, hey, listen to this, this is what I can do. Um, you're probably familiar with the free software called Audacity. Wonderful. You can edit your own stuff at home without paying for it. Um, I mean, it's not ideal, but I use it and I've had stuff Tell run. Us. On Radio 4. Yeah, tell the, river, the your River Thames when you first left oh, the right. BBC. Uh, when I stood down from presenting the world tonight, I needed to do something to rid my head of all the crap that was in it after <laughs> 23 years at the BBC. Uh, so I decided to walk the length of the River Thames from its source in the Cotswolds down to its the estuary at Woolwich. And um, because I'm an obsessive reporter, I when I got to the source, just had a few things in my head that I wanted to say. So I recorded them on my iPhone, just on the voice memo thing. And as I started walking, I started recording impressions as I went along. And I then thought, this is quite fun. And I took some photographs and I put together a little video essay, stills, music, my commentary, and uploaded it onto YouTube, put a link to it on Twitter, and there I was. Radio 4 phoned me an hour later. I said, hey, that, that was nice. Would you like to do some for us? And so I did a series of reports for Radio 4, walking along the River Thames. Some of them recorded on my iPhone. I then used a proper recorder later on, just as I went. All recorded, 
uh, very simply, edited on Audacity, easy peasy. Um, I think any kind of journalism, the best way into it is to do it and then send examples of your work to editors and say, look, this is what I can do. They need good journalism. That, that's what keeps me going and what should keep you guys going if you're interested in actually going into journalism as a, as a profession is there is a need for people to tell the stories. There will always be. Whatever the delivery mechanisms, whatever the new technologies that become available, somebody has to produce the stuff, the content, the stories. And that's what journalism is. That's what journalists do. There are a hundred different ways of doing it, but it's all storytelling. It's all to do with narrative. It's all to do with painting pictures. And there will always be a need for that. OK. On that relatively upbeat note, yeah. <laughs> I want to thank... I think it's been really... Really fascinating. I really, really, and so, Robin, many thanks. Thank you very much.